and welcome to worship for Sunday, November 15th, 2020, here at Second Reformed Church. My name is Pastor Katie, and I serve here along with Pastors Steve and Sophie Matinee Vanderwell. We would like to thank the folks who help make our video worship possible. Behind the cameras are Jim Emmert and Lauren Blom, and our music is provided by Krista Wild, as well as our Central College Scholarship students. We are so grateful for the work and the contributions of these folks so that we can worship safely and together. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who creates the heavens and the earth. Amen. O Lord, you take care of the earth, watering and making it rich and fertile. You soften the earth with showers and crown the year with an abundant harvest. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are decked out with grain. They shout for joy and break forth into song. Trusting that God is merciful and gracious, let us turn to God in confession. Let us pray. Generous God, you are unstinting in your goodness and the blessings you shower upon us. Yet we confess that no matter how much we have, there is always that itch, that desire for a little bit more that something new will satisfy us. We covet, we grasp, we hold tight. By your Holy Spirit, open our hands and open our hearts that we might be generous people who find joy in giving and sharing. Just as in Jesus Christ, you have shared yourself with us. Amen. So receive this good news. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation altogether. The old is past. Look, all things are made new. All of this is a gift from God, who in Jesus Christ has reconciled us to himself and now entrusts the task of reconciliation to us. 
This is the good news of the gospel. Believe it and be at peace. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. One God in perfect community, now and forever. Alleluia. Amen. And when we are forgiven, we ask how we should live freely. Zacchaeus said to Jesus, Look, Lord, half of my possessions I give to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I now repay them four times. Then Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this household. Amen. Children and all who are young at heart, this time is for you. Today is our last day looking for the green man. I have really enjoyed our time together learning to keep our eyes open to where we see beauty and goodness all around us. So it's been a fun time with the green man. I'm going to set him down just a second. This week, I was looking for the green man, but I never really saw the green man. Instead, I heard the green man. I was out walking my dog Twyla, some of you know her, and as I was walking along, I heard the crunching of all these leaves. Suddenly, the trees are looking rather empty, but the ground is covered with them. Maybe you've been helping rake leaves up in your yard, or you've been jumping in piles at school. But it made me think that sometimes we spend a lot of time looking for the green man or looking for beauty and goodness in the world around us. But maybe we can also find the green man by listening or by feeling the crunchy dry leaves in our hands or smelling the fall air or maybe tasting some apple cider. And we, we can experience the goodness and beauty of the green man and of creation with all of our senses. God talks to us and uh, shows up for us and is with us in things that we can see and in all the things we can't see. Even right now, I hear the wind rustling the leaves above me and I feel the leaves under my feet. So for the next while, 
even though we won't be talking about the green man every week anymore, my hope for you and my invitation is that when you are outside or in your home, when you're having a snack, that you would look for the green man, that you would listen for the green man, that you would know and experience the goodness and the beauty of God in all of your senses. Let's pray together and then we'll receive our blessing. Kind and good God, thank you for the ways that we have seen goodness and beauty this season as we've kept our eyes wide open for the green man around us. Thank you that we see goodness and beauty not just with our eyes, but that we can hear it, we can feel it, we can taste it and smell it. You are a God of all of our senses. We thank you for those good gifts. Thank you for loving us and for the beauty of your world. Through Christ we pray, amen. And now let's receive our blessing. Grow in wisdom, grow in stature, and grow in the love of the Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We're wrapping up our sermon series today, and our reading is from the final chapter, chapter 16. So listen now for the word of the Lord. Now concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches of Galatia, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you earn, so that collections need not be taken when I come. And when I arrive, I will send any whom you approve with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Keep alert. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. About 50 years after the events in the gospel, that is, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, a severe famine came upon the lands all around the Mediterranean Sea, what was then the Roman Empire. Particularly hard hit was the area around the Holy Land and Jerusalem. And particularly hard hit in Jerusalem was the church. Those followers of Jesus who formed the original community of Christians. In several of Paul's letters, he refers to a collection that he is organizing among the Gentile churches that he planted, an offering that he hopes to be able to deliver to the Jerusalem community. He wanted to show the churches in Jerusalem that the Gentile churches that he had founded and which were spread across Turkey and Greece and even Rome 
were concerned about the well-being of their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Today's reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 refers to this special collection. That's the background of what Paul is talking about. So just a few thoughts here. First of all, Paul sees this collection as an act of worship. If you'll remember, this is how he begins chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you earn so that collections need not be made when I come. The reference to the first day of the week, also known as the Lord's Day or Sunday, when Christian ga Christians gathered for worship, shows that that's what Paul was thinking. For Paul, there was no division between worship and giving. Giving was an act of worship. Not so much in this letter, but in other letters, Paul makes clear that the act of giving gifts is a response to God's gift of Jesus Christ. God's gift of grace to us. Another thing, Paul wanted this gift to be systematic. He asked the Corinthians to do this in his absence over time so that one big offering didn't have to take place upon his arrival. He even made plans for someone from Corinth to travel with him and deliver the gifts to Jerusalem. We have evidence that he spoke about this collection not just to the Corinthians, but also to the churches in Rome and across Turkey. This was obviously a widely organized effort. It wasn't just an impulse for one Sunday in one congregation. Now, if you know anything about ancient societies, then you may know that it was also common for cities and communities in the ancient world to depend on a system of patronage. The wealthiest citizens in a community would take responsibility for ensuring that the needy had enough, especially in times of famine or shortages. So in the church also, it would have been easy for leaders to develop a list of the wealthiest Christians in the city and to call upon them for support. But that's not what Paul did. Paul called on the church to respond as a unified body, not relying only on the most wealthy to aid the church in Jerusalem. He placed the responsibility of charity and love upon all Christians. It should be noted, however, that each person was only expected to give in proportion to what they were able. A couple of months ago, many of you remember that the derecho winds caused immense damage throughout large swaths of Iowa. And our deacons were wondering how we should help people in those affected communities. As you know, we decided to take up a special collection during the month of September to provide assistance and relief in Cedar Rapids. At the same time, however, we received a message from the people of the Hickoria Apache Reformed Church in Dulce, New Mexico. You'll remember that a team from Second Church went down to Dulce two summers ago to visit and work there with the people on the reservation. Apparently, during one of their consistory meetings, one of the elders in Dulce said, how often have we received help from churches in Iowa? Maybe it's time for us to send some assistance back. So they wrote to ask 
if they could forward us an offering that they had collected for the victims of the derecho. And they did. And we included it in our gift. There is something so beautiful about that story. No one, not even the poorest, is exempt from being a participant in God's beautiful economy of caring for those who are in need. There's another story like that that some of you may have seen in the news. Many of you know that when COVID-19 first struck, it hit the Navajo and Hopi reservations of New Mexico and Arizona particularly hard. More Navajo and Hopi people became sick per capita than in 48 out of 50 states at that time. Because of little access to medical care and clean running water, the casualties were particularly high. So much so that the tribe set up a relief fund online to help victims of COVID-19 and their families. After a few weeks, however, a strange trend began to appear. There was a steady stream of don donations coming from Ireland. Ireland? One Navajo elder was so intrigued that he decided to investigate further. Well, it turns out that a young Irish journalist had seen this relief fund online and had tweeted something about how Ireland should return a gift of gratitude to the indigenous people of the United States. So what's the story behind this? Well, in the early 19, 1820s, the Choctaw people of Mississippi were forcibly moved from their ancestral lands and relocated to Oklahoma in what we have come to know as the Trail of Tears. A large portion of the population starved to death during that long trek. The Choctaw had been settled in Oklahoma for less than 20 years, when in 1847 they heard about the terrible Irish potato famine that was happening clear across the Atlantic Ocean to people they had never seen and barely even heard of. Though they did not have much themselves, they were asked to make a donation toward those in Ireland affected by the famine. Amazingly, they did. They raised $170 to send to Ireland. Today, a sculpture that looks like a large circle of feathers has been erected in Cork, Ireland, in remembrance of their gift. It's called Kindred Spirits. And over 170 years later, the Irish people, out of gratitude for a centuries-old gift, decided to return the kindness. To date, more than a million dollars has been contributed toward the fund by people from Ireland. Again, what an amazing story. Both of these stories, as well as the story of the collection for the Jerusalem church, is a reminder that the body of Christ is not just a local thing. Not just our church, our congregation, our town, our group. It is global and stretches beyond bonds that can be seen. Many of Paul's quarrels with the Corinthians and the collection, according to his second letter to the Corinthians, arose from their lack of understanding about why they should care to financially support people who lived so far away and who were so different from them. Paul realized that the body of Christ is not just here, in Corinth, in Pella. It was flung far across the world. And one way to support one another is to be generous 
with one another. Not just monetarily, but also with our prayers, our encouragement, teaching, and learning from one another. One last story. When I served the First Reformed Church in Wymanskill, New York, there was an elderly couple there named Rolf and Wilma Gunderson. Because of their advanced age, they were seldom in church, but I visited with them regularly. When Rolf died in 1998, I officiated his funeral. The reception after the funeral was held in their home. Wilma was a genteel and elegant woman, gracious in so many ways. At the reception, she caught me aside and whispered to me, your husband is a tall and thin man, just like Rolf was. I wonder if he would like to take Rolf's cashmere coat. Then she led me to the closet where this beautiful dark gray 100% cashmere full-length men's coat was hanging. She offered it to me to give to Steve. It was a coat that we would never have dreamed of purchasing, much too expensive. But Wilma thought that it could get good use by a minister. And indeed, it fit Steve to perfection. That was over 20 years ago. And to this day, Steve still wears that cashmere coat every winter for funerals, at graveside services on Sunday mornings. It still looks as good as the day that Wilma gave it to him. And frequently, we mention the Gundersons when Steve slips it on as he lives, leaves the house. How beautiful that Wilma's gracious act of generosity would involve something as practical as a coat, something that covers the body and keeps us warm. Generosity, giving, caring for others, these are basic building blocks for the body of Christ. So it's fitting that Paul's letter to the Corinthians, which focused so much on the physical body, but also on the church as the body of Christ and the church's body life, would end with a plea for generosity. As Paul says over and over again, in his first letter to the Corinthians, let all that you do be done in love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we'll learn the final portion of our affirmation of faith that comes from the Shema. So the last portion for us to learn is, Oh, that you would love your neighbor who is like you. We'll try that one more time. Oh, that you would love your neighbor who is like you. And now we'll put the whole thing together. Listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Oh, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your strength. Oh, that these words I am commanding you today would be at home upon your hearts. Oh, that you would love your neighbor who is like you. Amen. For our time of prayer this morning, we will do as we occasionally do and pray facing the four different directions as just a prompt to our prayers. If you're in a place where you can stand and you're able and willing, I would encourage you to. If not, uh, you can turn and think about those directions in your imagination. 
We're going to face the north to begin with, so let's turn that way and call on the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Great, loving God, universe maker, covenant keeper, rescuer, we turn and we face north. And especially as the seasons slide toward winter, we think of the cold blasts that are coming, and some days have already been here. We pray for those then who live under bridges. We pray for those who are scrimping and saving by turning their thermostats down and are cold all the time. We pray for those whose cold blasts may not be physical, but have received bad news this week, who feel lonely, isolated, forgotten. Warm them and send warm people to them. At the same time, we look forward to strong winds from the north that would send fresh air through our church, through our lives, through our community, and blow this virus and this pandemic away and bring life and health and wholeness and fresh new life. Now we turn and we face the west, where the sun goes down, and we look back even on just the last few days, and we look back in gratitude on simple joys and pleasures, the routines of daily life. We look farther back and we see people, parents perhaps, teachers, mentors, coaches, pastors who have blessed us. We give you thanks. We look even farther back that you have planted faith in our hearts and you have loved us long before we even knew of you or loved you. We thank you as we look back. But we also look back and we know that there are places and patches in our journey that were difficult. Places that we have almost blocked out and try not to think about. Holy Spirit, help us slowly, gently, to find healing and hope. And where there is still hurt, where there is a need for reconciliation, give us wisdom and courage about what that might look like. We turn and we face the south. We think always of our friends in the churches south of us, our friends in Chiapas and Haiti and Taiwan, and Turkey. Thank you for their vibrancy. Bless them. May the day come, in fact it is already here, when we are blessed by them as much as we bless them. When we face south too, we think of the sun low in the sky but still shining, and warm breezes. Thank you for those gifts. And it's our prayer this morning that we would be sunshine and warm breezes to your world in words that encourage, in reaching out to the lonely, in sharing generously, in loving recklessly, that we might bring the warmth of Jesus Christ into your world. Finally, we turn and we look east where the sun rises. We look and we see our friends in the Netherlands. Bless them and their work and their family. But also we look ahead to more sunrises. And you know that even now we are probably making lists of things we must accomplish and looking at our calendars for the week ahead. Help us in a bigger way to trust that we walk into the future with you. And that in all of those events and activities and to-do things 
that occupy us, that our eyes might be lifted up, that we might see people around us, that we might engage them and listen to them and care for them and befriend them. Most of all, when we look east, we look and we see a manger. We see a cross and we see an empty tomb. And we are reminded that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and so that we enter the future hopefully, confidently, no matter what we face. And that whatever this week or next month might bring, still our ultimate future, our future forever is sealed in the grace and the love that you have poured upon us through the risen Christ. And now we join together and we say the prayer that this Christ has taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We closed our series on 1 Corinthians and body life by looking at Paul's call for generosity. And now it's time for us to think about being generous. And yes, that includes financially and our offerings. In the next few weeks, I'm sure you'll be hearing from our deacons because we rely so heavily on giving at the end of the year. But as we often say, generosity is much more than financial. It's the way we give our time, we listen to people, we have open hearts and open hands. So we invite you now to think about what does it mean to be generous for you this week? Who can you give to and give life to? Who can you share with and even receive from? Bless others and be blessed by them. And most of all right now to say not only to others, but just take a moment to say, now I give my life, my heart, my soul to Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's countenance be lifted upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.